Okay, so I'm Jemima Cowie and I'm part of the Outfix conservation team. Um, so our team consists of four conservative emerging conservation professionals <laughs> from Spain and Australia. The four of us have worked in um, the United Arab Emirates on material from the Saruq al-Hadid site for the past few years. So Saruq al-Hadid is one of the largest and most important um, Iron Age sites in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, 15 years of excavations and study by local and international teams has revealed more than 15,000 artefacts. The site itself is approximately one kilometre square and much of it is covered by more than six metres of sand dunes. So the types of objects found at the site suggest that the people at Surig al-Hadid were in contact with um, other contemporary civilizations such as Mesopotamia, Syria, India and Egypt. This contact was likely possible if Surig al-Hadid was at the crossroad between land and sea routes between these civilizations. So the site itself is between the sea and the Hajar mountains, um, which were likely the source of many of the raw materials needed at the site, such as the copper ore. So Saruq al-Hadid actually translates in Arabic to way of iron, which is an apt description for a site which appears to have been a centre for metals production. Archaeologists have found um, evidence of metalworking activity and furnaces for the processing of metal ore. As one might expect from a large centre of production, the Saruq al-Hadid site has revealed an incredibly broad array of objects. Over the past two years, we've treated very large swords, highly ornate daggers, axe heads, incense burners, decorated bowls, cauldrons, and my personal favourite, a dagger with a leaping feline handle, which will come up soon. Um, so in addition to thousands of metal artefacts, the site has revealed um, gold jewellery, pottery, finely worked stoneware, seals, and carved shells with gorgeous designs. Okay. Um, so to display just a small fraction of the collection, Dubai Municipality opened a dedicated museum last year in a converted historical building in the Shindaga Heritage Village. Um, and so for the past two years, Artfix Conservation has been tasked with the conservation of the metal artifacts from Surig al-Hadid. As can be expected, the copper alloy and iron alloy objects retrieved from the site have undergone considerable corrosion and mineralization processes. The presence of chlorides and moisture in the burial environment has meant that the copper and iron alloy objects are generally quite corroded. Um, this is further compounded by the storage of objects in environmental conditions with undesirably high levels of humidity, which has allowed corrosion processes to continue. Um, <laughs> All copper alloy objects that we've been presented with for treatment have had considerable amounts of chloride activity, which is often present not just on the surface, but within the walls of bowls, or even within the spines of uh, daggers. Sometimes we find sections of the desirable tenorite patina, but um, most of the objects only have a small amount of metal remaining, the rest having mineralized into brittle cuprite or um, other minerals. Uh, so fortunately, the iron alloy swords that we find are generally in a more stable condition with considerable amounts of stable magnetite, uh, which can usually be easily cleaned of the undesirable oxyhydroxide corrosion products. Um, some of these swords get up to 1.3, 1.4 metres long, so huge. <laughs> um, so aside from the chloride corrosion um, processes, we also have to deal with anthropic forces. Objects can be broken or placed under structural stress during excavation, find processing, transportation, storage, and even when placed on display. This is an ongoing issue for us as handling is performed not only by archaeologists and conservators, but by, but by laborers, drivers, and museum staff. Um, many of the objects assigned to us for conservation have previously been treated to some degree. So this might be as simple as the superficial removal of carbonates and chlorides using a mechanical approach or could even be an attempt at the restoration of the original form, as you can see from this spouted bowl. Um, these treatments were undocumented, or the documentation has since been lost, so the materials used in treatment um, can usually cannot be identified, such as the filler used in the spouted bowl. I'm sure a lack of documentation or access to this documentation is also an issue within the archaeology profession, um, but this issue seems to be particularly pronounced on projects with multiple teams, and multiple disciplines attempting to cooperate and collaborate. 
at Saruk El Hadid, this is further compounded by many of the teams being hired on short-term contracts. This could easily be um, improved with the dissemination of reports and research between each of the teams and disciplines. So um, I'll just briefly summarise the current International Code of Conduct for Conservation as held by ICOM CC, ECHO, ICON, etc. So firstly, minimal intervention is emphasised, holding only that treatments necessary to the ongoing stability of an object should be applied. Additionally, any treatment should show maximum respect to objects in their entirety. Every single object is a proof of history, no matter the chronology, size, material or authorship. In this way, treatment should ensure that to maintain or improve an object's legibility, but not at the expense of the object. Conservators should be aware of the causes of degradation and seek to prevent or minimise such degradation of any object through preventative <coughs> conservation techniques. Any treatment should ideally be reversible and sustainable with the stability of the object over the long term as the conservator's main goal. Uh, documentation of treatments and investigations are essential and should be available as a tool for multi and interdisciplinary collaboration to ensure a balanced and comprehensive analysis of an artifact. So, although off-site conservators can appear to be isolated from the excavation process, in reality, archaeological conservators are continuing the excavation in the uh, laboratory and as such should endeavour to incorporate the philosophies and practices of the head archaeologist into their conservation methodology. In this way, our treatment methodology was developed, taking into account the priorities of the archaeologist, the reality of the storage and con display conditions, and realistic expectations of how much each object will be handled by various parties. Um, so, as the study and excavation of the surrogality um, is ongoing, it is logical that treated objects will need to be accessed by archaeologists and specialists. Additionally, objects will likely be handled by labourers and museum staff who've had minimal handling experience and training. So for this reason, our treatments need to ensure that the final treated object has the structural strength to be handled by various parties. Um, and as many of the spouted bowls that we've treated have had very thin and brittle walls and bases, we decided to apply additional support um, by applying a layer of fiberglass netting to the interior surface of the bowl uh, using Paraloid B72. Um, and to mask this netting, we mixed some pigments into B72 and painted it over the surface of the netting. Paraloid B72 is easily removed with acetone and ethanol, so this is, should be easily removed in the future. Um, okay, so now I'll just give you a brief rundown of our treatment methodology. And whilst most of our treatments generally follow this format, um, Obviously, each object can present its own challenges and treatment needs, uh, which necessarily mean that we need to adapt this uh, approach. Each object is photographed prior to treatment, along with measurements, drawings, and condition diagrams. When possible, we x-ray the object. The surfaces of the um, metal artifacts are almost completely obscured by carbonates and corrosion products, and these are removed with mechanical cleaning using scalpels and rotary tools. Where possible, we do so under magnification. So a study by my colleague Alithia of the environmental conditions in the storage facilities and the museum environment show that the control of humidity continues to be an issue. As a city is flanked by a sea and the desert, humidity can fluctuate wildly, which makes it difficult to maintain environmental conditions appropriate for the storage and display of archaeological metals. Um, so for this reason, we apply benzotriazole to the surface of our cleaned objects. On um, copper alloy objects, this creates a film of copper benzotriazole complex, uh, which covers the surface and forms a barrier against moisture. We then apply a coating of Paraloid B72 across the surface. So the Paraloid B uh, coating provides a moisture and salt resistant barrier, and this coating is removable with acetone or ethanol. After the Paraloid B72 coating, we infill any losses with an epoxy putty called balsite, which we mix with pigments in order to tint it to the correct coloration. Finally, we apply Renaissance wax across the surface. Uh, this wax creates an extra layer of protection from moisture and salts and gives a desirable matte finish, unlike Paraloid B72, which can make objects look shiny and plastic. And then finally, we make a customized mount. This allows the object to be stored safely and minimises the risk of direct handling by untrained museum staff and labourers. Okay, so one of the main analytical, analytical techniques we use for inspecting objects prior to treatment is x-ray. 
Fortunately, the Heritage Department has a relationship with Dubai Hospital, which has meant that occasionally we're able to transport objects to the hospital and engage an x-ray technician and machine for several hours. Whilst the logistics of this arrangement have meant that we're not always able to x-ray every object, these x-rays have the potential to reveal a significant amount of information that's both relevant to a conservator and to an archaeologist. So an example with this, of this would be um, so a few months ago, we x-rayed objects that were due to be conserved. We were fortunate enough to identify several sets of decoration, including these fish present on a large scale, which you probably can't see. <laughs> um, this meant that during cleaning, we'll know what to expect and can place extra ca uh, care on retaining this decoration. Um, without this x-ray, it would have been very difficult to pick up on. Yeah. Um, However, x-rays do not always reveal decoration, as we found when treating these objects, which have been nicknamed anklets. Um, theories about their use include accessories for human beings, but the current accepted theory is that they were camel anklets. <laughs> they come in all different sizes, and during cleaning, it has become apparent that each anklet has different um, geometric designs incised on the surface. This was not detectable with an x-ray due to the density of the anklets. However, conservators not only use x-rays to Hit, detect hidden decoration, but to also analyze the density of an object, the level of mineralization, and any hidden cracks or structural issues. So some of the objects that have been to assigned to us have had clear signs of intentional damage. Um, so whilst it's not for us as conservators to theorize as to why these objects have been intentionally damaged, um, conservators can, buy, can provide an important resource to archaeologists in revealing uh, further information about this damage. Perhaps one of the clearest examples of intentional damage is this large cauldron. My colleague Lithia was responsible for this particularly challenging treatment, which revealed that the base of the cauldron had been considerably uh, bent and crushed. The holes in the walls were visible before treatment, but Lithia was able to reveal that the holes had been made by piercing the walls externally, potentially, I guess, changing the interpretation of this damage. Um, so another clear example of the intentional damage is this dagger. Um, this treatment was completed by Lola, who revealed a relatively detailed sword, um, which had been intentionally bent into this L shape. Lola was also responsible for the treatment of this bowl, which appears to have been subjected to direct flames. After treatment, the peculiar patterning of the damage also became clearer. So whilst it's not for us to interpret the intention behind this damage, the conservation treatments of these objects have provided information to archaeologists, which can in, um, influence the interpretation of an object, context, or even the entire site. Um, so this was one of the first objects that I treated. Um, so whilst treatment has not only revealed um, hidden decoration and intentional destruction, but we've also found evidence that some of the objects were indeed used by the peoples working at Saruk al -Hadir. So one of the more uh, most obvious examples of this was the large, this large cauldron. Um, it became apparent during cleaning that it was possible repair in the wall of the cauldron below one of the handles. A segment of metal seems to have been attached using metal pins, possibly repairing a hole. Not sure. Prior to cleaning this, this was barely visible under layers of corrosion products and had not been noticed by the archaeologists until I had ex extensi extensively inspected the cauldron prior to treating it. Okay. So whilst it should be clear how work in conservation has contributed to the archaeological understanding of the material culture of Saruk al did, I'd like to um, end with some reflections on how the relationship between archaeology and conservation can be improved. Uh, with so many parties involved in this project, it has become apparent that there, was, that there is a strong need to introduce individuals to the philosophies and practices of the various disciplines at work. Um, this will encourage interdisciplinary communication and collaboration. In the Saruk Al Hadid project, the current capacity and output of the conservation team is dwarfed by the output of the archaeology teams. Um, this is an issue considering the volatility of archaeological metals and uh, the sheer number of metal artifacts that have already been uncovered. So it's 15, 16, 17,000 by now. <laughs> so considerations for the appropriate storage of these artifacts should have been taken into account at the early stages of the project. And plans for future expansion of the project should take into account the actual capacity and resources available for conservation. 
Um, and this pressure to treat large numbers of objects combined with the relative isolation of the conservation team from the other international excavation teams mean that we do not always have the luxury and resources to devote um, time to the in-depth investigation of individual objects. This is further compounded by the fact that we do not usually have access to excavation reports or initial documentation. So whilst conservators have a lot to offer an active archaeological project, conservation can only be truly effective with the cooperation of archaeologists and other disciplines. So on behalf of Lola, Luthier and Alithia, I'd like to thank Dubai and Min Min <laughs> Dubai Municipality for allowing ArtFix Conservation to present our work to you today and Cardiff University and TAG for hosting this event. And as a final note, I'd like to invite you to visit the Surik Al-Hadid Museum the next time you're in Dubai. Thank you. <laughs>